Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's November 18th. Today, we celebrate the man who was a gardener and a poet, and he inspired the trend toward the picturesque natural landscape. We'll also learn about the Swiss botanist who specialized in mosses, and we'll remember the birthday of the father of American botany. We'll take a look back at a popular November fruit. I use it to make a traditional Thanksgiving salad. We'll salute November in the garden with wise words from a gardener and writer. And we grow that garden library with a beautiful book that will help you become a houseplant master. And then we'll wrap things up with a little note about goldenrod and asters. Well, before we get started, I'd like to encourage you to head on over to thedailygardener.org in order to sign up for the free Friday newsletter. So all you do is head on over, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see a sign up, and it'll say, sign up here for the free Friday newsletter. Now, what do you get with this Friday newsletter? Well, if you sign up, you will get a personal update from me every Friday, along with garden-related items for your calendar. You'll also get to see all the Grow That Garden Library featured books for the week, along with garden gift ideas, garden-inspired recipes, and exclusive updates regarding the show. Plus, each week, one lucky subscriber will win a book from the Grow That Garden Library bookshelf. So head on over to the Daily Gardener. Dot .org and sign up. For today's curated news, I selected an article that was written by Rita R. Robison over at Seattle PI, and the article is called What to Plant in a Winter Garden. Now, in this very brief post, Rita shares what she's personally growing in her winter garden. So if you're looking for some ideas, it's a great place to get started. And if you're ever wondering where you can find my curated news articles and original blog posts, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community, and you'll never have to take any notes or search for links because you'll find it all in that group. So the next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the poet and landscape gardener, William Shenstone, who was born on this day, November 18th, 1714. In the early 1740s, William inherited his family's dairy farm, which he transformed into the Lezos. The transfer of ownership lit a fire under William, and he immediately started changing the land into a wild landscape, something he referred to as an ornamented farm. William wisely bucked the trend of his time, which called for formal garden design. He didn't have the money to do that anyway. Yet what William accomplished was quite extraordinary. His picturesque natural landscape included water features like cascades and pools, as well as structures like temples and ruins. Now, what I love most about William is that he was a consummate host. He considered the comfort and perspective of the garden from the eye of his visitors when he created a walk around his estate. Wanting to control the experience, William added seating every so often along the path to cause folks to stop and admire the views that William found most appealing. Then he incorporated signage and inscriptions with beautiful classic verses and poems, even adding some of his own, which elevated the Lezo's experience for guests. 
Today, a little bench at the Lezos shares this verse from William. Here in cool grot and mossy cell, we rural fays and fairies dwell. After his death, William's garden became a popular destination, attracting the likes of William Pitt, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. One of the main reasons that we know so much about William Shenstone is thanks to his neighbor, Henrietta, or Lady Luxborough. After having an affair, Henrietta's husband sent her to live in his ramshackle estate called Barrels. The experience was a revelation for her, and Henrietta began to study landscape design. Even though he was 15 years younger than her, William mentored Henrietta, and they corresponded about their landscapes and daily life. Over time, Henrietta began to do a complete landscape makeover at Barrels, and she wrote to William, I have a garden which I am filling with all the flowering shrubs I can get. I've also made an aviary and filled it with a variety of singing birds, and am now making a fountain in the middle of it and a grotto to sit in and hear them sing. And today is the birthday of a son of Switzerland, Charles Le Creux, who was born on this day, November 18th, 1806. Leo was born with a naturalist heart. A self-described dreamer, Leo loved to go out into the forest, and he collected all kinds of flowers and specimens for his mom. Yet when Leo was just seven years old, he fell off the top of a mountain. He was carried back to his home completely unconscious with multiple injuries to his body as well as head trauma. Leo remained motionless and unconscious for two weeks. His survival was a miracle, yet the fall resulted in hearing loss that would eventually leave Leo utterly deaf by the time he was a young man. Despite the tragedy, nature still ruled Leo's heart. As Leo matured, he tried to provide for his family as a watchmaker, but he found himself returning again and again to the outdoors. Eventually, Leo began to focus his efforts on peat bogs, and his early work protecting peat bogs attracted the attention of Louis Agassi of Harvard, who invited Leo to bring his family to America. When he arrived, Leo classified the plants that Agassi had discovered on his expedition to Lake Superior. Then on Christmas Eve, 1848, Asa Gray summoned Leo to help William Starling Sullivan. Gray predicted that the collaboration would be successful, and he wrote his friend and fellow botanist John Torrey and said this, They will do up bryology at a great rate. La Cruz says that the collection and library of Sullivan and muscology are magnifique, superb, and the best he ever saw. Leo packed up his family and traveled to Columbus, Ohio, settling near the bryologist William Starling Sullivan. Now, bryology is the study of mosses. The root bryos is a Greek verb meaning to swell. And it's the etymology of the word embryo. Bryology will be easier to remember if you think of the ability of moss to expand as it takes on water. Mosses suited Leo and William Starling Sullivan's strengths. Mosses require patience and close observation, scrupulous accuracy, and discrimination. Together, Leo and William wrote the book on American mosses. William funded the endeavor, and he generously allowed Leo to share in the proceeds.
1873, William contracted pneumonia, ironically, an illness where your lungs fill or swell with fluid, and he died on April 30th, 1873. Leo lived for another 16 years before dying at the age of 83. It was Leo LeCru who said, My deafness cut me off from everything that lay outside of science. I have lived with nature, the rocks, the trees, the flowers. They know me, and I know them. And today is the birthday of one of the leading American botanists of his time and a member of Team Darwin, Asa Gray, who was born on this day, November 18th, 1810. In 1857, Asa Gray received a confidential letter from Charles Darwin. In the letter, Darwin confided, I will enclose the briefest abstract of my notions on the means by which nature makes her species, but I ask you not to mention my doctrine. Asa encouraged his friend to publish his work post-haste. Two years later, Darwin revealed his concept of natural selection in his book on the origin of species. Early adopters of natural selection, like Asa Gray, helped to advance the march of all science. It was Asa Gray who said, Natural selection is not the wind which propels the vessel, but the rudder, which, by friction, now on this side and now on that, shapes the course. During his long tenure at Harvard, Gray established the science of botany, and he guided American botany into the international arena. He also co-authored Flora of North America with John Torrey, and it was Asa Gray who said, Faith in order, which is the basis of science, cannot reasonably be separated from faith in an ordainer which is the basis of religion. And it was on this day, back in 1843, that cranberries were causing a sensation in towns and cities around the country. The New England farmer shared a charming update on the demand for the seasonal fruit, saying, Cranberries, this pleasant fruit is now received in large quantities from the West. The crops in the east are cut off in great measure by frost. No doubt Michigan cranberries will be eaten in the very headquarters of Cranberries, Barnstable, Massachusetts. We had no idea until today of the quantity sold in this city. But within a few days, one house on Front Street sold 250 barrels of cranberries from Michigan at 6 to $6.50 a barrel. The demand is more than they can supply. Of the same lot, 300 barrels went over the Western Railroad to Boston and were sold there as soon as received. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from the garden writer and gardener, Beverly Nichols. Most people early in November take last looks at their gardens and are then prepared to ignore them until spring. I am quite sure that a garden doesn't like to be ignored like this. It doesn't like to be covered in dust sheets as though it were an old room which you had shut up during the winter, especially since a garden knows how gay and delightful it can be, even in the very frozen heart of the winter, if you only give it a chance. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book. The Q Gardener's Guide to Growing Houseplants by Kay McGuire. This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is The Art and Science to Grow Your Own Houseplants. 
In this book, Q Guides Today's Houseplant Gardener. If you feel like your houseplants are unhappy, or if you feel you need a little upgrade to your houseplant know-how, this book is the solution. Q shares insights into the plants that can handle neglect and the plants that need babying. Popular plants like cacti, succulents, and air plants are profiled. Q also shares the houseplants that are prized for their flowers, their foliage, fragrance, and even air purifying abilities. Nurture your houseplants and take a restorative escape using the tips and projects in this attractive guide. My favorite aspect of this book is the mix of botanical prints with modern photographs that share step-by-step instructions and inspiration. In addition to covering the basics of selecting, potting, general care and feeding, the author Kay McGuire teaches you how to prune and propagate so you can make more plant babies. This book is 144 pages of beautiful advice and inspiration for houseplants, and I think it would make a wonderful gift to accompany a little houseplant for someone in your life. You can get a copy of The Q Gardener's Guide to Growing Houseplants by Kay McGuire and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $2.00. Now that is absolutely criminal. Fantastic deal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, November 18th in 1881, that Asa Gray received a letter from his botanical friend and colleague, George Engelman. So he wrote him back in December, and here's what he said. My dear old friend, it is shabby of me to wait so long in response to your kindly greetings, which were dated on my birthday, November 18th. But I was very busy when it came, and hardly less so since, and so I let it get out of sight. Accumulated collections from Lemon, Parish, Cusick have taken up all my time now, And now I think I can get back to my flora work again. First of all, I need to finish my manuscript for Solidago and Aster. Solidago, I always find rather helpful. Aster is my utter despair. Still, I can work my way through, except for the Rocky Mountain Pacific species. I will try them once more though I see not how to limit species, and to describe specimens is endless and hopeless. Well, since Asa's lifetime, the aster genus has been narrowed and now has around 180 species. Solidagos are commonly called goldenrods, and there are nearly 120 species of them in the aster family. Finally, here are two fun facts about Solidago, or goldenrod. Medicinally, goldenrod is extremely effective for treating urinary tract infection. And Thomas Edison made his tires for the Model T that was gifted to him by Henry Ford using rubber extracted from the goldenrod plant. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the 
stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.